do not know a lot about the past. Often the data that have reached us are scant. And historians have to make conclusions based on circumstantial evidence. For example, there are no preserved texts describing the building of the temples in Baalbek. We have no photos or videos of those times. Sometimes scientists have to speculate. But for those speculations to stay scientific, we have to keep in mind the rules of scientific thinking. Rule number one. Any statement requires evidence. I don't think anyone can argue with that. Rule number two. Occam's razor principle. If there is a simple explanation, there is no need for a complicated one. Rule number two says, entities should not be multiplied without necessity. For example, I left a glass of water on a windowsill. A day later, the water disappeared. I can surmise that the water was drunk by the Martians. That's hypothesis number one. Or that it evaporated. That's hypothesis number two. Both are theoretical, as nobody knows what really happened. Right? Rule number three. A scientific hypothesis should agree with the data that has been accumulated by science. Let's say somebody says that the ancient Romans used an excavator in the first century AD. But an excavator cannot exist by itself, separated from everything else. It needs an internal combustion engine or some other engine. It needs fuel to work. This means someone must produce the fuel first. Somebody must mine raw materials to make the fuel by using heavy machinery. And there would be traces left from all these activities. The machinery needs spare parts. To make an excavator, you need a factory. Not some handicraft store, not a workshop, not a smithy, but industrial-scale production. This kind of production started in Europe just a couple centuries ago, as a result of the Industrial Revolution. It includes mines, factories, railroads between them, dormitories for the workers, and all of that. Throw out any of these links, and there will be no industry. So where are the traces? Where are the foundations of the factory buildings? Where is the waste, the mountains of slag, if there were quarries, smithies and mines? There are burials containing ceramics, iron tools, ornaments, dwellings, furnaces, mills, livestock enclosures, theaters and temples, after all. And where is the mechanized production? The historians are hiding the truth? But why then weren't the results of activities of this civilization, the ancient buildings, hidden along these traces of factories? Well, maybe then the manufacture was done on another planet. Okay. Then why would aliens from a super civilization build walls of large rocks? Even we, humans, switched to different principles of construction before the space age began in the middle of the 20th century. The Baikonur Cosmodrome wasn't built from limestone blocks. Why? Because we have more efficient construction methods. Just think about it. Well, that was a prelude. Our dream has come true. The editors of Anthropogenes Ru go to visit Baalbek. It's a small town in the mountains of Lebanon, known for its gigantic ancient temples. One of the previous videos featured a live transmission. And now I want to talk about what is known to scientists about the construction of the ancient structures in Baalbek. And about what is only a hypothesis now. If you search YouTube for Baalbek, you'll get lots of videos with screaming titles like mysterious, enigmatic, incredible, built by giants. I like one of the titles especially. Historians are prohibited from visiting there. 
It seems like somebody forgot to tell all the scientists that come there, the French and the German expedition, that they are prohibited from coming. Archaeologists continue to work in Baalbek, even in the 21st century. You can also learn from some YouTube videos that archaeologists hide the results of excavations. Having rummaged in archaeological publications, and there are plenty of papers on Baalbek, I guess I figured how scientists hide their discoveries. Guess how? By publishing them in French. The best means of hiding something from a Russian speaker is an article published in French. Luckily, my wife is fluent in French, so it's hidden from me, but not from my wife. Our visit to the temple complex left us awestruck, though the temple of Jupiter was wrapped in restoration scaffolding at the time. The sheer magnificence of the structures shakes one to the core today as much as it did in the 19th century, when Kaiser Wilhelm II ordered this site to be excavated for the first time. But alternative historians don't seem to care much about the beauty of the porticus and the columns. The trilithon is what attracts most of their attention. It's a structure of three huge stone blocks, each over 19 meters, 61.3 feet long, over 4 meters, 12.9 feet high, and almost 4 meters, 12.9 feet wide. Each block weighs 800 tons. At the same time, they are placed at the height of 7 meters, or 22.5 feet. The trilithon is a part of an enormous unfinished podium surrounding the Temple of Jupiter. Other blocks of the podium are also very large, some weighing no less than 350 tons, and those in the row under the trilithon weigh up to 500 tons. The splendid columns of the Temple of Jupiter are seldom shown in sensational YouTube videos. And yet, there are 19 meters, 61.3 feet long, the outermost ones being single pieces and weighing 135 tons each. For some reason, the temple of Bacchus is deprived of its share of attention. The temple, which, quoting a pseudoscientific website, was clearly built later and is of no interest. There's a low-key detail about this temple. Large entrance into the temple and the three-block cover over it. The keystone weighs 20 tons, and two counter keystones weigh 50 tons each, and all of these is placed at the height of 13 meters or 41.3 feet. And this structure has endured several earthquakes going as far back as antiquity. The keystone indeed slipped down but did not fall out. This is documented by photographs dating back from the early 20th century. German restorers first propped it up with a brick column and then put it back into place. So why are these details neglected by pseudoscience? Perhaps it's because it's obvious even to alternative historians, except for the most die-hard ones, that the temple was built by the citizens of the Roman Empire, and not the Atlanteans or the Anarchy. Let's assume that the temples were built by the Romans not from scratch, but on top of more ancient Cyclopean structures. The megalithic podium is almost like an antediluvian cosmodrome that had stood there for millennia until it became a foundation for the temples. Swiss author Eric von Deniken, in his book Chariots of the Gods, writes, lies a platform of stone blocks, some of which have sides more than 65 feet long and weigh nearly 2,000 tons. Van Deniken, in a manner peculiar to him, very slightly, just by 2.5 times, exaggerates the weight of the blocks. Until now, archaeologists have not been able to give a convincing explanation as to how, why and by whom the terrace of Baalbek was built. However, Russian professor Agrest considers it possible that they are the remains of a gigantic airfield." End of quote. Well, let's look at the construction timeline here. Archaeologists know perfectly well that this place has a long and complex history starting in the Neolithic and that the ancient temples in Baalbek have predecessors. The irony is that the megalithic podium may have been built not earlier than some of the Baalbek structures, but as late as the Roman era. But how do they know that? In fact, there are two podiums. The Temple of Jupiter, of which there are only six columns left, 
is located on the inner podium. But the second, the outer podium, is the one that contains the megaliths and surrounds the inner terrace at some distance. So which one was the first? The inner structure or the outer one? Let us suppose that somebody built this outer podium first. But then it would become truly weird. There we'd have an unfinished podium, but we wouldn't use it or finish it. Instead, we'd build inside of it another one with a gap between them. What would that be for? That would make no sense. Rather, the reverse sequence appears more likely. First, the inner podium was built and the outer one was erected during the second phase of construction. Excavations and analysis of the structure show that at some point the inner podium was T-shaped with wings running out on the eastern side, which were later disassembled. And in the places where the wings once were, the outer side of the podium, which is otherwise very neat and facade-shaped, is made from irregular, roughly hewn blocks. It is likely that the plan was to build a temple on this early podium, which was then either not built at all or fully dismantled. We have no evidence. But when was that inner podium erected? 10,000 years ago? Maybe 20,000? Specialists' estimates are rather humble. The first century BC, the time of Herod the Great. The case in point is the second temple in Jerusalem, which is pretty much alike. According to written sources, the construction of the second temple, or rather a scaled-up upgrade conceived by Herod the Great, was happening at the turn of the 20th century. It started around 20 BC. The Romans who took Jerusalem back after the revolt in Judea in 70 AD turned the city into ruins and demolished the recently finished temple. Only the western wall of the foundation has been preserved, the legendary Wailing Wall. Architects Andres Krop and Daniel Lawman mention the striking similarity between the inner podium in Baalbek and the western wall in Jerusalem. This is a distinctive style, the so-called drastication, when the facade part of the block is roughly chiseled, but the surface along the perimeter, 5 to 10 centimeters, 2 to 4 inches wide, is smoothed out. As a result, the central part of the block protrudes, the wall relief is raised, and the joints are more precise. But it's not just the style, even the block sizes are similar. The average height of a black row is 1.11 meters, 43.7 inches, and in some parts of the wall there's an alteration of rows of short and long rocks. This Herodian length style is found not only in Jerusalem, but also in other places, where Herod's contribution is evident, for example in Hebron, in the so-called Cave of the Patriarchs. But the temples in Jerusalem and Baalbek are different from the rest. The rusticated laying technique was used for the foundation and the podium only in those two temples. It's quite uncommon and it confirms a close connection between the two projects. Historians suppose that possibly the same team of specialists may have worked on both sides. Herod, known not only as a cruel tyrant, but also as a great king, a builder, a supporter of projects, strived to strengthen his position and secure Roman support, so he generously sponsored projects on Roman territories. There is written evidence for that. Herod's contributions include the wealthy Roman colony in Beirut. It was a period of large-scale construction. Construction was underway in Jerusalem, Petra, Damascus and Palmyra. The construction was stimulated by ambitions of the local rulers who strived to outdo one another. In 15 BC, the Bekaa Valley became a part of the Roman colony. It is believed that that was when the big construction started in Heliopolis. Yes, Heliopolis, the city of the sun, is the same thing as Baalbek. 
The project may have been initiated by some local ruler, but Herod provided the technical support by sending in his experts. That is when, perhaps, the first podium was built. But for some reason, the construction was discontinued. Perhaps they ran out of money? It resumed again in the first century AD, when new builders made changes to the project. The terrace already built was not small, 95 meters, 306 feet long. But they decided to encircle it with an even more imposing podium upon which the massive Temple of Jupiter would be erected. You may wonder how we know that the megalithic podium and the Temple of Jupiter were built at the same time. Here is the answer. In 1969, during archaeological excavations, the lower level of the blocks under the trilithon was cleaned off. A chunk of a column was found that was used to replace one of the blocks, and this chunk had the same size as the columns of the Temple of Jupiter. But as this chunk is underneath the trilithon, it could only end up there before the huge blocks were put in place. This means that when the podium was being built, the columns for the Temple of Jupiter were being cut in the quarries. Secondly, the archaeologists discovered a schematic on the top surface of the southernmost block of the Trilithon. This is a full-scale schematic of a part of the pediment of the Temple of Jupiter. The schematic covers the whole top of the megalith and is partly concealed by the blocks on top. Today, the schematic is barely visible because of maintenance work, but if you look closely, you should see a part of it in the photo. Here is a render of the schematic made by archaeologist Eritun Kalayan. And this is not the only such schematic. Seven similar schematics have been discovered on the territory of the Baalbek Temple complex. Evidently, the Roman architects used this method for construction planning. The builders drew the schematic right next to the structure itself, most likely to verify their work. So, it looks like the Trilithon was being built at the same time as the Temple of Jupiter above it. Finally, on the upper part of the upper drum of one of the columns in the Temple of Jupiter, a negligent inscription was found, cut perhaps by a mason. The inscription, written in Greek and mentioning the festival of Aphrodite, contains a date that indicates that the inscription was made on the 2nd of August of the year 371 of the Seleucid era. Look, Edos means year, and this is the date, Alpha Omicron Tau. Alpha means 1, Omicron 70, Tau 300, 371. The Seleucid era started with the rule of Seleucus I Nicator from 312 BC. So, the year 371 of the Seleucid era is the year 60 AD. If the inscription was made during construction, then we have a date for the construction. There's an argument that the inscription was written during construction and not after it. There is an orifice in the butt end of the column for a lead rod used to pin together the column drums. And this orifice pierces through the inscription, rendering some of the words unreadable. You may ask, why is the inscription written in Greek? Heliopolis was part of a Roman colony. However, Syria was a Hellenized part of the Roman Empire and long after preserved the influence of Greek culture. Here, Greek was spoken and written, Greek gods were worshipped. Thus, the language of the inscription was also Greek, and so was the chronology used. And Heliopolis means the city of the sun in Greek. And the builders in Baalbek were citizens of the Roman Empire, but were not Romans. For the most part, they were likely locals, Syrians. Doubter Aaron Edair argues that the grandiose construction in Heliopolis was not likely to have happened before the turn of the common era. His point is that in ancient written sources the city is not mentioned, neither in the Syrian texts starting in 9th century BC, nor during the times of Babylonian or Persian rule. Greek geographer Strabo wrote about the territory of the Bekaa Valley in the 1st century BC, describing the local farmers with no mention of monumental structures. Did the geographer see the enormous stone structure, but for some reason choose not to mention it in his works? I doubt that. 
Thus, we have all the reasons to argue that the first, or inner podium, was built during Herod's rule, during the last decade of the first century BC. And the second megalithic podium and the Temple of Jupiter were built in the first century AD. Alas, the construction remained unfinished as well. It was interrupted for decades, restarted, and the project was altered multiple times. The podium was never finished. Instead, two courtyards were built before it, surrounded by walls. More than 180 pink and grey marble columns were delivered from Egypt for the grandiose project in Heliopolis. The Temple of Bacchus in Baalbek was erected in the 2nd century AD. The Temple of Venus was built a little later. At the end of the 2nd century AD, the Temple of Jupiter appears on Roman coins. Another inscription inside the Temple of Jupiter tells us that the Propylon, the front entrance to the temple complex, was erected in the name of Emperor Caracalla, who ruled in the early 3rd century AD. Thus, the whole construction took over 200 years to complete. There are other inscriptions in Baalbek. Signs or emblems were found on some elements of the great courtyard of Baalbek, different in the northern and southern parts. In the northern part, it's two letters E, positioned at an angle to each other, found on stones and columns. Similar inscriptions were found in the quarry. In the southern part of the courtyard, the letters are M, E, R, sometimes reversed right to left. It seems the builders were Semitic, traditionally writing right to left. Archaeologist Haritun Kalayan believes they are emblems of different construction teams. Only stones that had some defects were marked with these emblems. They said to the examining officer, do it again. What do you think this tells us? It tells me that no super technologies were used during construction. The structure was built by humans prone to error, who had to be supervised. What's also interesting is that the construction was abandoned at some point, which gives us a clue about the sequence of operations on site. We can see that the podium blocks were first roughly hewn in quarries, then installed, and then trimmed, straightened out, aligned with one another. This work was not fully finished, that is why you can see the different stages of processing the megaliths. This is clearly visible for both the northern and the western side of the podium. What kind of aliens are these, leaving a job halfway done? By the way, not just the podium is unfinished, the bases of many columns in the Temple of Jupiter are also incomplete. Look! Architect Maxim Atayans surmises that the temple itself was not completed. We also visited the Roman quarries, located 800 meters or about half a mile to the southwest of the temple complex. You can get a coffee there and observe the famous stone of the pregnant woman for free. Until recently, it had been considered the largest single stone block hewn by the ancients. It weighs in at around 1,000 tons. On the top edge of the megalith, there's an ancient inscription surrounded by modern graffiti. But it is poorly preserved and cannot be deciphered. In the 1970s, during excavation work in a different area of the quarries, another megalith was found, an even larger one. The stone of the west weighs a staggering 1,200 tons. Unfortunately, nowadays this part of the quarry has been turned into a garbage dump by the locals. Finally, in 2014, during excavation work next to the stone of the pregnant woman, another block was found, estimated to weigh about 1600 tons. And this is the largest single block in the world, comparable to the Thunderstone in St. Petersburg, Russia. The Thunderstone was delivered to the installation site for many kilometers away. The Baalbek megalith never left the quarry. Experts still speculate about the places these megaliths would take in the structures. Judging by their size, they were meant to be placed in the podium next to the trilithon. According to Daniel Lawman, the podium would require 10 more blocks like the ones in the trilithon to hug the temple from three sides. The biggest block, judging by its size, was meant to be placed in the row above the trilithon. Lawman believes that after the construction was finished, 
The resulting structure would be a canonical Roman podium. In the lower row the surface is angled at 52 degrees. Thus, in the upper row there must be a reverse incline, so that the row is hanging above the trilithon and so should be wider. Take a look at the podium of the Temple of Bacchus or the podium of the Propylon and you will see the same picture, just on a smaller scale. Fourteen blocks are required to fill the perimeter of the podium from three sides. Fourteen blocks of 1500 tons apiece. I would like to see that. Evidently, the man hours needed for this wild goose chase were too many even for the aliens. Somebody must have changed the project and the megalithic construction ended. Now about the tool traces. On some blocks of the podium and the megaliths in the quarries, you can see long curved grooves. What were they made with? A jackhammer? Or maybe an excavator? Maybe. But the traces are similar to those left in quarries in the not-too-distant past. Here is, for example, an area of a quarry near Bern in Switzerland, 19th century, where the usual hand tools were applied, the pick and the chisel. Take a closer look. It is clear that in both places the traces are not quite parallel. They are of different length, in some places they converge. This characterizes manual and not mechanized labor. To clarify this, I talked to a French archaeologist, Jean-Claude Bessac, a specialist on ancient stonework tools and himself a hereditary stonemason and author of many works on the topic. According to him, the traces on the blocks in Baalbek were left with pickaxes. He even sent me an image of such a tool. One can be confused by the length of the trace, but one should not confuse the length of the trace with the length of the working body of the tool. In this case, it is the trace a pickaxe would leave after striking the wall of the trench. That is, the mason was striking, slowly getting deeper into the stone, and the trace was getting longer. My colleagues disagree. The thing is, the traces start right next to the lower edge of the megalith on the stone of the south. And if one was working with a pickaxe, it is not clear whether there would be room to swing the tool. Creator of the forum What the Ancients Could Do, Oleg Kruglakov, and geologist Pavel Selivanov supposed that the work was performed with a chisel and a hammer. The master craftsman would chisel out grooves and then chop off the rock between them. As for the curve of the grooves, it was dictated by a more convenient position of the tool. In the upper part, the blows would be struck upwards, and beneath, they would be struck downwards at an angle. Archaeologists speculate that the work was performed with pickaxes, but the question arises as to how one could swing the tool in such a low niche. That's quite problematic, so we came up with an idea that it was done with a chisel. We want to check this hypothesis and see if it's true or not. Here I'm standing next to a niche. It's actually almost the height of a standing individual. But here we also have a homogeneous layer of limestone, and we'll assume that here is where the niche starts. That's the best spot we could find. I'll try not to go outside the border with the tool. If we imagine working with a pickaxe, the swing is not too wide and the power of the pickaxe is in the swing. Now I'll try a chisel. How would I do it? Assuming that I need to take off layer after layer, I would chisel out grooves relatively parallel to one another and chip off the rock between them to do minimal chiseling. But here is a question. Let's say here I can squat and lay a groove. Can't say it's going very easy. The rock in this layer is rather solid. The layers in Baalbek must be softer. 
I can lay a groove like this down to the very bottom, and it will be relatively straight. But I won't be able to strike the upper part in the same way. Because I'm right-handed, I have to turn around and drive the chisel in this direction. Let's try what I can get out of it. I reached a cavity here, and you can see that the groove is not equally well chiseled, because the wall is originally not straight, and in some places you've got to chisel out a lot of the rock, and in others you don't. When the surface is smooth, it can be chiseled out as a single layer. Now let's lay another groove. So we've got two distinct grooves. They may look pretty unassuming, but we're just demonstrating the method here. They are parallel in the lower part, going down at the same angle, and in the upper part they take a curve and become almost vertical. That is caused by my working position. One more thing. The Balbi grooves are noticeably flattened in the lower part. At first I thought that was caused by some differences in the rock, and that maybe they were trying to walk around that by chiseling at a different angle, but now I realize that it could be unrelated. While bending like that, it's not very convenient to lay straight grooves. I'd rather bend like so, and lay the groove almost horizontally or at a slight angle with flattening. Now for the last touch. We need to chip off the rock between the grooves, which should be pretty easy. It gets pretty easy to chip off quickly. It's more convenient to chip a piece off than turn it into dust. Further on, I would use the same grooves because they are outlined already. I deepen the groove, chip the rock off and work like that till the groove is complete. Just like that. I'll add that these traces were found not only on the base of the stone of the pregnant woman, but also on the stone itself. After the cutting, the surfaces of the block were smoothed out on three sides, but on one of the sides, the northwestern one, the work was not finished, and it has the same grooves. The marking line, up to which the surface would have been smoothed out, is clearly visible on the top surface. And if somebody forgot their school course of history, iron was widely used in ancient Rome. There is also a different type of traces on the megaliths of the podium, multiple parallel grooves. One place you can find them is on the facets forming joints between the blocks. What kind of tool can leave traces like that? Perhaps it's a toothed chisel, with three, eight or ten teeth leaving parallel traces. I have this tooth chisel, and I'm holding it for the first time. A tooth chisel, and here is a dolomite quarry with some parallel traces left by some Martians. Not me, of course, and I'll try to copy them. Judging by the traces in Baalbek, a similar tool was used. No conspiracy involved. The traces look very similar. A lot of questions arise because of the orifices in the blocks. In some of the megaliths, there are multiple orifices like that. 
Archaeologist Jean-Pierre Adam suggests that this is where rope fasteners were inserted for the Roman hoists or winches. As multiple ropes were needed to manipulate the block, one would just snap, so multiple orifices for the ropes were needed. This is countered by the fact that the orifices like those are also present in unfinished blocks in the quarry, even in its walls. Archaeologist Janine abdul Massi, who led the 2014 excavations in Baalbek, believes that the orifices served not only for ropes used during transporting the blocks, but also the ropes supporting the blocks during the cutting stage. Oleg Kruglikov thinks that the orifices were made to support the stonemason's scaffolding. One more mystery. Why was this exact location chosen for cutting the megaliths? Weren't there better spots around? No, there weren't. Because for a big block, one needs a large chunk of good quality, homogeneous limestone. Limestone tends to consist of layers, and the ancient stonemasons used this natural stratification to their advantage. In fact, they disassembled the limestone layer by layer, in that case it is easier to separate it from the bases. But to achieve a certain size of the block, a layer of certain thickness is required. In the Balvik quarry, where the blocks were cut in steps off the slopes, the upper layers are 1 or 2 meters 3.2 to 6.5 feet thick. The medium-sized blocks were cut out of those layers. A larger block cannot be cut from there, it would simply fall apart. A big limestone body is located further down, slightly more than 4 meters 12.9 feet thick. Notice that the height of the trilithon and the stone of the pregnant woman are approximately the same as the thickness of that layer. So it's obvious that the ancient stonemasons used the natural rock structure, following the layer. There's an interesting detail. A fairly straight crack is visible under the megalith. How was it made? Was it sawed or cut with a laser? Geologist Pavel Selivanov believes that the crack is of natural origin. It formed on the border between different types of rock. The crack could have been hard to spot until the block was cut, since it's just a difference in the density of limestone, and the rock is easy to cut around there. And when the rock was exposed due to external factors such as humidity and temperature swings, the crack became visible. Researching the stone of the pregnant women gave a clue as to why it was possibly abandoned. A cavity and more cracks in the northwestern corner of the stone were found. Because of this defect, the block was abandoned, and the second megalith, located next to this one but lower, was cut at a slight angle to the first one, leaning only a few degrees to you north. Perhaps this is how they were trying to work around the dangerous zone. Is working limestone difficult? To check this, I picked up a stone in the quarry and struck another one with it a few times, and shards started flying immediately. I think cutting the block was not a problem at all. Delivering it was a different thing. The works of several ancient architects have reached us. The most renowned are the ten books on architecture written by Vitruvius in the 1st century BC. We know that the Romans actively used mechanical devices during construction, such as winches, blocks and cranes. The largest crane that used the drum of a hamster wheel type, with workers inside, was capable of lifting up to 10 tons of load. We have images of such mechanisms on reliefs, for example from the mausoleum of Hatteri, built at the beginning of the 2nd century AD, now preserved in Vatican City. Jean-Pierre Dam believes that the Romans could use several such cranes at the same time, lifting dozens of tons of load. The ancients knew that by using the rule of the lever, one can multiply the force while losing in distance that the workers walk while turning the winch. And they also knew that rolling friction is less strong than sliding friction. This is the principle used in transporting huge weights over wooden rollers. Such a method was used starting in deep antiquity, evidence suggests. By the way, the only modern society that still practices megalithic burials on the island Samba in Indonesia uses the same transporting technique. You can see on video groups of people pulling a stone that weighs a good 10 tons over wooden rollers at a pretty good speed. There are also images of winches the Romans used to transport massive cargo. 
I have already mentioned one of the examples. The obelisk of Theodosius in Istanbul, also known as the obelisk of Thutmose III. This Egyptian monument was transported from Karnak, Egypt, to the city of Constantinople, over 2,000 kilometers or over 1,200 miles away in the 4th century AD. The obelisk, or actually a part of it weighing 280 tons, was installed on a marble pedestal as part of the barrier in the center of the Hippodrome of Constantinople, where it still stands today. The transportation scene is depicted on the marble pedestal. We can see the obelisk lying flat on the ground in front of the column of the Hippodrome and the workers pulling it using winches. So we know that the Romans did have heavy construction machinery allowing them to move cargo weighing hundreds of tons and lifting cargo weighing dozens of tons. But how did they lift an 800-ton block to the height of 7 meters or 22 feet? The thing is that they most likely did not have to. The quarry is at the same height as the temple complex. Physicist and doubter Aaron Eder bases his opinion on the topographical map of the US Navy, which shows that the quarry is located slightly above the Temple of Jupiter. Google Earth provides different data. According to Google, the stone of the pregnant woman is about 6 meters lower. We also need to add an extra 7 meters or 22 feet of the level where the trilithon is located. In any case, if a long embankment is made to install the megalith, for an embankment 800 meters or 2500 feet long, the angle of ascent will be tiny, around 1 degree. The location of the megalith is in fact in a pit. So, would the stone have had to be pulled out from the pit? But we've got to keep in mind that the landscape has changed over the past 2,000 years. The ground level has actually risen. It is evidential enough to just look at old photos of the temples to see that thanks to the archaeologists' efforts, the temple was dug out from under about 6 meters or 19 feet of soil. So the pit where the megalith is now was dug by archaeologists. To the south, the quarry is surrounded by cliffs, but there are no cliffs in the direction of the temple complex to the northeast. Now there are people's homes there, but at some point there must have been a road leading to the construction site. Jean-Pierre Adam has calculated, using the data on the winches used during the transportation of the Thunderstone in St. Petersburg, that six of these winches, operated by 24 individuals each, would be more than enough to transport a block weighing 800 tons over wooden rollers on a good Roman road. So, for the whole process, a total of 144 people is required. First, the block would have been turned by 90 degrees to face the construction site. Today, the stone of the south is perpendicular to that direction. Do you need factual evidence that this was all possible? Experiments on transporting large cargo using mechanical force have been conducted multiple times. Thor Herdahl experimented with that stuff on Easter Island and Richard Atkinson in Stonehenge, England in the mid-20th century. In 1996, a group of 100 people pulled a 45-ton stone for 18 miles for a BBC movie without any winches, simply over guide rails lubricated with fat. The famous Wally Wallington from Michigan moved a 20-ton barn by himself. But the most extraordinary example, documented in film Chronicles, is the transportation of Mussolini's obelisk from the quarry in the Apple Alps in 1928. The 300-ton chunk of marble was put inside a wooden case, weighing an extra 50 tons. 36 pairs of bullocks put it along wooden rails lubricated with soap for 11 kilometers or nearly 7 miles to the haven. You may say that 350 tons is not the same as 800 tons, but 11 kilometers is not the same as 800 meters. Let's remember that in 1769 the 1500-ton thunderstone was transported over 8 kilometers or almost 5 miles to the shore of the Gulf of Finland with the help of winches. Yes, moving a cargo like that was a no mean feat, but as we can see, it's still feasible. I guess the most difficult part was not cutting out the stone or transporting it, but actually installing it and adjusting the blocks. The tales of ideal joints where even a blade will not fit are often just an overstatement. 
But in this case, I can confirm. The vertical joints of the blocks are really fitted very well, and in some cases not even visible, unless you take a closer look. As I mentioned before, this adjustment was performed on location, after the installation. But how was it done? The issue is that the blocks would need to be put together, the irregularities marked, then the blocks pulled apart, smoothed out, and put together again. That would include moving about an enormous megalith that had already been taken off its wooden rollers, so that the force of friction would have increased dramatically. Jean-Pierre Adam thinks that the builders might have used liquid clay to minimize the friction. Anyway, many more workers in winches must have been mustered for this task. Architectural historian Friedrich Rajet thinks that a block would need to be slightly lifted, at least to take the rollers out from underneath. He believes that a structure with multiple winches, ropes and iron anchors for the top surface of the block would have done the job. By the way, archaeologists have actually found several such anchors. Those were commonly used in antiquity. Each anchor can sustain the pressure of up to 5 tons, so one would need at least 160 of such orifices to lift an 800-ton block, 8 orifices per every meter or 3 feet of length. A part of one of the megaliths is visible from above, with easily noticeable orifices, but the total number of the orifices is still debatable. Oleg Kruglakov thinks that the so-called grinding by sewing technique may have been used to lift the blocks when two roughly shaped surfaces are put face to face and the joint is sawed top to bottom. The saw goes down easily enough. It does not really need to go through stone. It slips through the crack and saws off small imperfections. That way you can get a good quality crack with flattish walls. After the sewing, the blocks can be put together to form a joint. The process may have been repeated several times, sewing through and pulling together, sewing through again and pulling together again. This is the way the stones forming the outer layers of the Egyptian pyramids and the blocks of the basalt floors in Egypt might have been worked as well. In some photos of ancient Egyptian monuments, traces of such sewing are visible on the surfaces underlying the joint blocks. Even if this method was used, the block would still have had to be moved around during installation, but on a smaller scale. For that you would need a large steel saw, since the width of the face of the block is more than 3 meters, or about 10 feet. Experimentalist Nikolai Vasutin thinks that it was not necessary for the builders to join whole faces of the blocks. It would have been enough to make small ledges along the perimeter of the block so that the center of the face of the block is located in a cavity. That would lead to smaller sewing lengths. Architect Maxima Tayans suggests a possible use of rope covered with an abrasive material instead of a saw. Such a method is recorded from antiquity. He also points out that multiple ancient temples, and there are thousands of them preserved, have blocks that are noticeably well fitted. So this is not a unique trade for the structures of Baalbek. Complicated? Yes, it is. But does this serve as evidence for alien technologies? When one has super technologies, there's no need for finishing off roughly shaped blocks and trying to fit them to each other after installation. There is no need for being so specific about the location for cutting the block. A technologically advanced civilization does not depend so vastly on the quality of the raw material, since it produces the building materials itself. All these are just consequences of imperfect technologies, specifically stone masonry. The facets on the joint edges are another interesting thing. What were those for? Perhaps they helped make the joining easier to make the joint more visible. In that case, they would have been worked on before joining the blocks. If you still doubt that this can be done manually, just watch these two videos by stonemason Ray Sumner. In the first video, Ray shows how to make a smooth facet on a stone block with a set of chisels. And in the second one, he makes a curvilinear relief on a stone. There, in addition to the chisel set, he uses a saw and some abrasive material.
One more difficult question. How do you smooth out the lower surface of a block? How do you get to it with the wooden rollers in the way? One option would be to dig a pit, like a car mechanics pit, and drag the block over it. The workers in the pit would have been able to smooth out the surface above their heads. But in that case, there should be a gap between the rollers. Hmm, not too convenient. Oleg Kruglikov thinks it would have been easier to flip a block over on its side, so that its side would become its bottom. This would also require some technical solution. But if somebody managed to move a block 800 meters, 2500 feet, flipping it onto a side would not be a problem for them. We figured out how these structures were built. So now let's talk about their purpose. It's kind of baffling that in a Roman colony, Roman temples are more grandiose than in Rome itself. I like this analogy here. Nobody in Russia is surprised that the Motherland Coal statue, which at 85 meters, over 270 feet tall, is one of the largest statues in the world, stands in Volgograd, former Stalingrad, and not in Moscow, the capital of Russia. Why not call it a statue of a gigantic Amazonian that has been there since time immemorial? You can guess that a more prosaic explanation can easily be found. We don't know the reason why the megalithic construction happened in Baalbek and not in Rome, although Rome, of course, was not built from wooden sticks either. The Roman pantheon has 16 monolithic granite columns, each weighing 60 tons. And those were brought not from 800 meters, but as far away as Egypt, a couple thousand kilometers away. And still, specialists discuss the reasons behind the megalithic construction in Baalbek. What was its influence? Was it the Eastern Phoenician tradition, or just a carefully selected location? Baalbek is conveniently located next to a source of top-quality limestone, meaning a short distance to the construction site and a solid stone structure. That is what allowed to cut the huge blocks. By the way, we see similar stuff in Jerusalem. The limestone was provided by quarries located very close to the construction site. One of the quarries was found right next to the northwestern corner of the wall. The same goes for the Syrian monument Hassan Suleiman, where the quarries are less than 100 meters or 300 feet away. Besak thinks that this is one of the main conditions for serial megalithic construction, when not just one or several large blocks, but lots of them were required. One would have to find huge and very homogeneous layers of the building material without any cracks in direct proximity to the monument. The stone itself should have been of a very good quality, as a screwed up megalith is a very real and unpleasant hazard. As examples, we can cite the cracked obelisk in Aswan or the stone of the pregnant woman we talked about earlier. There are not too many places that satisfy these conditions, and that may partly explain the absence of similar projects in Rome, since in Rome, travertine and tuff were the main building materials. These are soft rocks that are easy to extract from the ground, but they are a poor choice for megalithic construction. But even so, why build from enormous stones when one can do the same with smaller ones? The first idea that comes to mind is that it was done to make an impression, to impress the temple visitors, to boast the magnificence and the power. Comparing the sheer size of the blocks to the average human height and thinking about the enormous power needed to move the blocks, the visitors would surely have got dumbstruck. For an ordinary believer, the moving of such huge mass would be beyond their imagination, beyond their personal experience. And they would have believed that it was impossible without divine intervention. Loman notes that the size of the blocks in the Baalbek podium increases with the height of each row. Today, 2000 years later, the effect is still achieved. We hear Baalbek was clearly built by the gods. Yes, indeed, that is the kind of feedback that the builders did their best to get. But not all researchers find this explanation satisfying. Basak, for example, states that a megalithic podium is not the best method of impressing someone since one enters a temple, one does not see the podium. Also, after the construction is finished, all of that would be covered in stucco and paint, which would hide the seams, so differentiating the scale of the blocks visually would be impossible. Besak names two other possible reasons. 
First, seismic performance. This is an unstable region with a fair amount of earthquakes, and the ancient builders knew that very well. One of the methods of resisting demolition is using massive blocks which can provide greater seismic performance of the structure with their sheer weight. There have been plenty of earthquakes in the region in the last 2000 years. Quakes were recorded in the 6th, 12th and 18th centuries AD. The monument sustained serious damage from the quakes, but it didn't get completely destroyed, proving that the construction materials were chosen wisely. We should also keep in mind the economy part. Besak shows that using a myriad little blocks instead of one large one would have increased the number of quarry trenches and surfaces that would have taken up a lot more time and money. A lot of material would have been wasted as the trenches between blocks would need to be 50 to 70 centimeters, 20 to 28 inches wide, and the small blocks would need extra cutting to fit them together. Indeed, the work is not finished at that, since to transport a large block, one needs to build a big ramp, install the winches, etc. Nonetheless, with well-organized management, a megalithic construction may turn out to be more lucrative, considering the number of personnel required and materials used, as compared to a construction construction process where small blocks are used. What else do archaeologists know about the Baalbek quarry? In the eastern part of the quarry, where the stone of the south is located, one can see artificially made caves, perhaps used to live in or for storage space. Excavations inside one of them made archaeologists assume that a smithy was located there. The remainders of a furnace, a lot of coal, pottery shards and iron slag were found in the deposits and no microchips or even spare parts of an excavator were found. The authors of a paper that came out in 2015 write about a possible trace of a winch, but don't go into detail. What is missing? In my mind, there aren't enough large-scale experiments like the transportation of a megalith or fitting two blocks to each other. We would love to try out something like this, and maybe, sooner or later, it will become possible. Will the structures in Baalbek become less majestic if we acknowledge that they were built by men and not by gods? Of course not. We admire the Baalbek builders' engineering genius, their volition and their firmness of purpose. Was doing this extremely difficult? Yes, for sure. But a modern city dweller has some trouble imagining themselves as an ancient builder. Is there still room for riddles, hypotheses and scientific debates? Oh, plenty enough! I have listed only some unsolved problems, but in search for answers, let's not multiply entities. Do you disagree with me? Okay, that's perfectly fine. Do you argue but give me something more than just emotions as an example? Yes, that's fine. Do you think that the evidence we have is not enough? That there are not enough archaeological findings and the interpretations are too frivolous? That historical examples and experiments do not prove anything? Perhaps it's so. And here is the question in that case. What findings, what facts can you provide that counter what I have told you about? If you think that the logs will not hold the weight, the ropes would snap, or that so many people will not fit into the construction site, show us how you calculated that. If you think that these traces were left not with a pickaxe or a chisel, but rather with a jackhammer, an excavator or a plasma saw, do give us examples of such traces. You can't find the right ones? Do an experiment then, since archaeologists have been doing that for a long time, and even I managed to do something. Engage specialists, but a modern engineer may be of little help since they would not have been taught how to work with a pickaxe or a manual winch. And enough of retelling von Däniken and Sitchin. Enough of showing the same pictures from the Internet. Start thinking with your own head. I'd like to thank Alexei Shedrick and Alexei Travnikov for their help with the experiments, Science Video Lab for their help with the camera work, the staff from site team for their help with the camera work in the quarry near Moscow. You will find a link to the list of used literature in the description below this video. Feel free to read through that, although to read some of the articles you'll need to be fluent in French. 
The story was narrated by Alexander Sokolov. May the force of true science be with us.